Stand on your feet. We always stand for the reading of God's Word, and I appreciate you doing that. Best sermon ever, talking about the Sermon on the Mount. We're just going passage by passage through this thing, and we're uh, ending up in chapter 6, and then we'll get into chapter 7 over the next couple weeks after that. If you're in your Bible, say amen. amen. Who's on the church app, and you've actually got the outline? You're following along. I was just wondering how many people do that. A few of you. Okay, appreciate you. Wonderful. Here we go. Today we're talking about treasure hunt. You ready? Say giddy up. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there is your heart also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. If your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot, it didn't say you should not, it said you cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat, drink, about your body, what you'll wear. It's not life more than food and body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of those. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what will I eat? What will I drink? What will I wear? For the pagans, the unbelievers, the non-followers of Jesus run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. That's a verse to underline. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about self. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Come on, somebody say amen to that. Amen. Don't worry about tomorrow. We got, we got today, y'all, to worry about. Jesus, your word is powerful. Our prayer is that you would speak it by the power of the Holy Spirit through an imperfect vessel. <clears throat> Teach us things that we don't know. Remind us of things that we knew that we've forgotten. Challenge us on things that we know that we've yet to obey. Because the blessing, Lord, is not in the knowing, it's in the obeying. Teach us to do this life your way as kingdom people, specifically in the area that we're talking about today. And next week, we'll pray the same thing about the topic we're talking about next week. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for loving us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. you may be seated. This best sermon, man, is uh, Jesus is covering a lot of material. He's covering a lot of topics. And he raised the bar a couple of weeks ago already on, you thought adultery was this, but I'm telling you, you can't even look at a woman and think about it. That's adultery. And you thought murder was killing somebody. Well, murder is actually hating somebody in your heart. He's already taken this thing up to a high level of expectation. Remember, he's telling his followers, this is us. This is who we are. You're going to follow me? It ain't going to be easy. We're raising the bar on what you always thought you knew. Last week, we talked about prayer and fasting, and we talked about serving and how you shouldn't be doing that to be seen by everybody else. You should do it at a higher level just to be honoring God and loving people. Today, we're getting to that fun topic where we're talking about money, and he's beginning to talk about our financial lives and our perspective on how we view money, how we view our income, uh, how we view our stuff. And he looks at them, he says, just as I've been saying all this other stuff, if you're going to follow me, this is us, we're raising the bar on how people do money and how people do stuff. It's not going to be the way your friends are doing it. We're raising the bar to a higher level. There's this whole passage we read, breaking it up into four sections. So let's just get right into it. Number one, his number one uh, thrust of this teaching is, use your blessings now to invest in forever. If you got blessings here and now, you need to use those to invest in heaven and hereafter. Bottom line is we come, and it's worse in the Western world, in the United States of America, the pop prosperity we enjoy. This is a much bigger deal than in third world countries because, man, stuff is where it's at. 
We want the latest gadget. We want the most uh, advanced. We want the sharpest looking car, the biggest house. We want all this stuff. We want an income. We want our nest egg. We want to feel independently comfortable. I mean, financially comfortable. We want all that. So when he starts saying, you need to stop investing so much in stuff here and there, it, it rubs us the wrong way. I mean, immediately some of you are already uncomfortable because you think I'm going to take up an offering or something here in a little while. I'm not. So just breathe just a second. But we have to start saying, you know what? It's not a problem to need the things Jesus is talking about. The problem is instead of needing things, need turns into greed. And the greed is the sin. The need is not the sin. And the wanting your needs to be covered is not the sin. But the greed for more and the greed for excess is the sin. And the question becomes, how much? When is enough enough? When is enough stuff enough stuff? You ladies, go in your closet. I got nothing to wear. <laughs> Danette says that. I walk in that closet and I'm like, <laughs> that's odd because I see about 120 options right here. You walk in the pantry, there's nothing to eat in this house. We have no idea what it means to have nothing to eat. And, and Earth.org, they actually have this, I don't know how you do this study, but they said the average U.S. consumer throws away over 81 pounds of clothing every year. They've just had enough of it, and they just throw it away. When is enough enough? When do we have to buy, when is we going to stop buying that next thing, the next greatest thing, right? So, uh, and then, then John D. Rockefeller, the great tycoon of the early 1900s, and by the way, if his wealth was translated into today's money, he would be wealthier than Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates combined. And he was asked, so how much, how much more money do you need? You know what he said? Just a little bit more. It's always just a little bit more. So Jesus comes knowing he's talking, and the reason he talks about money so much, he knows it's an issue. He knows we're going to have an issue, y'all. So he says, hey, here's what I want you guys to do. Verse 19 through 21. Don't store, store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and vermin uh, destroy, where thieves break in and steal. Instead, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal, where your treasures are where your heart be also. So immediately he starts talking about investments. And we even know in this dimension what a good investment is and what a bad investment is. A bad investment is anything you spend money on, and in a few years, the value of what you spent on is depleted. If you spend something and it's not worth anything in a year, that was not a great investment. So obviously, usually property or land or a home might be a good investment because they often hold value or increase in value. But a car is not so great of an investment because it's going to decrease in value right when you drive it off the lot. Right, So we, we judge investments on ROI and judge investments on how much value it will have at the end. Jesus comes to this and he says, no matter what your investments are on this planet, it's inferior to eternal investments because they're all temporary. Moths will destroy. It doesn't matter if you've got product, Michael Kors, or Fruit of the Loom. A moth is going to destroy it all. It doesn't matter how much you spend on it. A moth will destroy Rats will eat away at the wood in your house. It's going to destroy. Termites will do their job. And even if it can't, even if it doesn't lose value by diamonds or jewelry or you got a heart and you say, this thing will hold value, somebody can still break in and steal that thing. So Jesus saying, no matter what or how much stuff or how cool your stuff is or how valuable it is, even if you own hundreds of acres worth millions of dollars, when you die, the land doesn't go with you. You're leaving it to your wife and that next guy she's going to fall in love with and that sucker's going to be hunting on your land. <laughs> Does that make you happy? Was it worth it? It's all temporary. But Jesus said, but if you, and I, I find this to be comforting right away. First of all, there's heaven, everybody. Amen. Heaven is not a, a figment of our imagination. It's not a fairy tale and it's not a place on earth. There's heaven. We have something to look forward to here. And Jesus says there's a way to where you can invest in eternity and you can invest in heaven. And when you invest there, there are no moths there and there are no rats there and there are no thieves there. When you invest there, your investment is secure. Never fades, never goes away. Our investment in heaven will outlive us here and we will inherit an even greater reward if we, inherit, if we invest there. So Jesus said, you know what? I don't want you to have wealth being your pursuit or your master. You know, he's saying the investment is in the future. 
So he, he's looking at them and he says, instead of investing on things down here, invest in heaven. Now, there's nothing wrong with wealth, everybody. Listen, you need to hear this. There's nothing wrong with having stuff. The question is, what are you doing with what you have? The question is, does it have you or do you have it? Money is a horrible master. But it comes down to saying, you know what? Where my, where my money is is where my heart is. And this is where he throws the trump card down. And you cannot circumvent this with any kind of justification. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Your heart follows your money. It happens. I, I tell the membership track this sometimes. Uh, COVID hit, and you know, and it, it rocked some certain markets. And it rocked the travel industry. Well, I noticed Carnival Cruise Line stock plummeted. I mean, it went from like 60 bucks a share, and it was down in the $8 per share. And, dude, I'm not a stock guy at all, but I'm like, this, this right here is a no-brainer. I can make some bank right here. You know what I'm saying? So I, I went on uh, uh, E-Trade, whatever, dot com. I, I, you know, I said, I'm going to become... I'm going to become a big dealer. I'm going to wheel and deal. I'm going to make some change right here. So because I knew if it was $8 and it could bounce back up to 60, that's 700% return, y'all. So I threw not a lot of money, but a little money at it, right? It ain't going to make or break me. So I threw some money at it. And do you know what I did after that? Every day after that, you know what I was doing? I was checking the carnival stock. Do you know how many times I had done that before that day? Zero. I don't care about Carnival, Royal Crown, I don't care about any of them until I get on their boat. That's when I care. But all of a sudden, I'm watching. I'm concerned. I want to know. I want Carnival to do well. Still hadn't bounced back yet. <laughs> Why did I get so focused on it? Because my money went there. And when my money went there, my attention went there, and my affection went there. And anytime you put money somewhere, your heart follows it. That's why it's important you give to the kingdom. That's why it's important you invest in heaven. You invest in things that outlive you. How do I do that? You, there's so many opportunities. Obviously, there's church. There's Tekoa Life. There's FCA. There's Samaritan's Purse. There's human, Christian, Christians fighting human trafficking. There's missionaries. There's Christian orphanages. All these things are giving to eternity. The question is, where's your heart? Is your heart here on the earth or is your heart in heaven? Show me your spending, and I can tell you what the answer is. Jesus says, use what I'm blessing you with here to invest in the future, invest in eternity. The second thing he says is to develop a lens of generosity through which you see God and view life. And as you read this passage, did you catch when he started talking about your eye is the lamp of the body, and if your eye is good, the whole body will be full of light, and if your eye is bad, the whole body will be full of darkness, and it looks like it's out of place, really. It's like, okay, so he's talking about investing in, the, in, in heaven and using our blessings here to invest in heaven. In a minute, he's going to tell us that we can't serve both God and money. In another minute, he's going to say, stop worrying about all the stuff. God's got you. And in the middle of this excerpt, he's saying, if your eye's bad, your whole life's bad. If your eye's good, your whole life's good. It looks like he's out of place, but you have to put it in context and understand the words good and bad uh, as he's describing I in the Greek. The Greek word for good means pure or single, and it's also used in the New Testament for generous. The word bad eye is evil or dark, and it's also used in the word ungenerous or stingy. Now we're getting in the context of what he's saying. And he's saying, don't forget, if your eye is generous, if your eye is looking through a lens of benevolence and generosity, then your whole body, your whole life will be full of that light. But if your eye is dark and stingy and greedy and ungenerous, then your whole life will be informed by the eye. Following me? So now he's saying, I want you to start looking at God and looking at life through the right lens. And there's two options. You can look through the lens of generosity or you can look through the lens of being ungenerous. And here's the way they play out. Option one, if you look through a bad eye and the bad eye is stingy, greedy, ungenerous, you're looking at God the same. You don't think God is with you. You don't think God is for you. You don't think God is your provider. You think you are your source. You think you're the one responsible for everything that goes on in your financial world. You think you have to show up and provide everything. You think in a, on a rainy day or in a financial crisis, you're on your own. 
So no wonder if you're looking at God through a stingy eye, you're looking at the world through the same stingy eye. Because all of a sudden, if I'm on my own and God is not going to be faithful to help me, then I'm going to live a narcissistic life. And I'm going to scratch, claw, cheat, steal, borrow. And my mind is going to say, i got to get all I can get, hold all I can get, hoard all I can get, because I've all, I'm all I've got. When I look through a bad eye, it's all about me, and I've got to take care of me and mine. That's option one. But Jesus says, I want you to have a good eye, a generous eye, where you look to God and you see God through the lens of him being a generous, benevolent father. Now all of a sudden, I know God is Jehovah Jireh. He's my provider. My company is not my source. My 401k is not my source. God is my source. He's always by my side. If I hit a financial crisis, I'm not alone. He will see me through that. So if I can count on God to be generous and benevolent to me, I don't have to be so selfish in my, li in my, in my lifestyle, so narcissistic, so hoarding. I can be generous because I know that he's generous to me. And that liberates me from materialism and greed. When I know that God's going to take care of me regardless, I've got a good eye. And that eye informs how I live. That eye allows me to give to the church. That eye allows me to give to someone else in need. Because my giving to someone else doesn't rob me of me. It makes sure that God is going to continue to bless me. Because he knows if he can bless me to me, he can bless others through me. That's when you have a good eye. So he says, develop a lens of generosity through which you see God and you view life. Make sense? Then we get to number three, and he says, choose your master wisely. You can only pick one. You can't have three or four. You can't have two. In the verse 24, he says, no one can serve two masters, for you either will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and wealth. Not you shouldn't. You can't. Impossible. It may sound wrong at first, but God and money have some similarities. You ready? Both of them have the ability to captivate the heart. Both of them can become a pursuit both of them can be loved. The love of God is what his followers do. But you remember what he said about the love of money? The love of money is the root of all evil. And both of them, say I'm listening, demand obedience. Both of them want to be master. Both of them want to rule over your life. And Jesus uses this word when he actually says no one can serve two masters. The word is actually a slave word. We have, we have all kind of stigma attached to that term slave, and it's exactly what you think it is. Back in a, a ancient Bible times, if you were a slave, you belonged, you were property, not even a person. You were property to somebody else. And he's saying, if you were a slave, you couldn't divide your loyalties between two or three masters. If you were a slave, you were owned by one, you answered to one. The Greek word is dolos, D-O-U-L-O-S. And it actually comes to a point, there's some of those slaves who their masters treated them so well that they chose to remain a slave when they were free to go because they wanted to serve the master who was so good to them. That's a sermon and all by itself right there. When you realize the one who lords over you, loves you, and is the best life you can have is with him, no longer are you a slave by chains, you're a servant by choice. And that's the word he uses, D-O-U-L-O-S. And he says nobody can serve two directions. You can't split your devotion. You'll either love the one and hate the other, or you'll love the other and hate the one. It's got to be one or the other, so choose wisely. I'm sitting here and you say, well, do I have a problem? Well, let's, let's, walk, let's walk it down. If you can't obey the simple things God says about money, you've got a problem. I mean, let's just go to elementary school. We're talking pre-K financial living as a Christian. Whether you call it tithing or first fruits giving or putting God first in every paycheck, whatever. if you don't have a rhythm of giving that is commensurate with your income to where you're putting God first, 
Guys, that's first base on this thing. First base. That's not advanced calculus. That's pre-K. And you can't even obey in that, then God is not the master. I don't know how else to say that. If, if, if God comes to you and wants you to be kind to your neighbor who's going through a need or kind to someone who has medical bills piling up and he wants you to prepare a meal or he wants you to buy them a gift card and you balk at that, you, you got a problem. If a missionary comes along and he wants you to, instead of going on that vacation, he wants you to drop all that vacation money on the missionary and you say, hey, hey, now, that's, that's crazy, God, you know, that's a little extreme, then he's not Lord. He's either Lord of everything or he's not Lord of anything. The term Lord means he has authority over every domain of your life. And if there's ever anything he wants you to do and you say, uh-uh, then he's not Lord. Y'all okay out there? It's one or the other. First Timothy chapter 6, Paul's talking and he says, Many eager to get wealth has departed from the faith. Did you notice how he said it? Many people who were chasing money left the faith. Why? Because a love for money and a love for God does not coexist. You can't pursue both of them. Now, don't get me wrong. You can fool me. I'm a dumb, bald-headed pastor. That's all I am. And you can, you can, I don't even know, I don't even look at who gives hardly at all. On occasion. But I, I can think you're the most generous person in the world. And you know what? Your, your $400 every month might be, might be generous or it might be stingy and you're just tipping. I don't know. And that's cool because it's not between me and you. God knows if you're giving generously. God knows if you're giving obediently. You're not here to please me. If y'all are here to please me, y'all messing up. You're here to honor him. You're not here to be somebody in this church. You're not here to be known as that giver. You're known, you want to be known as a person who loves the Lord and he puts him first in every area of their life. And only God knows if you are. Now, like I said a minute ago, it's not a sin to be wealthy. Thank God. Somebody needs to say, well, thank the Lord. Don't, don't say it because then they'll think you're wealthy. But anyway, what I'm saying is you can't look at people who are affluent and blessed and think they're out of the will of God. That is not the situation at all. God allows people to be blessed because sometimes he gives them the gift of generosity and the gift of giving so they can be a blessing to the kingdom. Sometimes they just are gifted with business acumen and they're successful in their ventures. That is a gift from God. However, even though wealth is not a sin, if you're on the wealthy side or comfortable side, you need to hear me. It is a solemn responsibility. You've got a lot more to answer for than others. So instead of congratulating the wealthy, we need to pray for the wealthy because they've got a lot more responsibility. Jesus said in Luke, to whom much is given, much is required. So it's a responsibility for those who are wealthy to honor God with that wealth. And not the, not, do you know what the acid test for lordship is? You ready? Everybody say, I'm listening one more time. It's trust. Where is your trust? It's funny that finances and faith often have an inverse relationship. The more money we have, the less faith we need. And the less money we have, the more faith we need. Why is that true? Because our trust ends up in the place where we believe is going, what we believe is going to be there for us. So if we have wealth built up, 401k, stock options, all that stuff, and we've got that, if our faith is in that, then that's what we are following and pursuing. But if our trust is in the Lord, and by the way, for those who are affluent, you can reach this point. You can have a lot of stuff, but still your trust be in the one who blessed you with the stuff. That's what you need to go after. To be humble enough to say, I would have nothing if it wasn't for him who blessed me. And to say, I know because he blessed me, I'm meant to be a blessing. So I'm not going to let this 401k, this financial situation lord over me. I'm going to honor God and eternity with what he's blessed me with. That's when you know your trust is in him and not in it. So here's a challenge right now. Y'all ready? I want you to show it who's boss. 
Show your money who's boss. How do I do that? You take it and you submit it to something God wants you to do with it. I'll sh- you think you boss money? I'll show you right now. I'll write a check right now to that missionary orphanage. Bam! You are not my God. I'm investing in kingdom stuff. I'm investing in eternity. Amen. Amen. That, that's good preaching, Pastor. Thank you so much. I know it is. It's great preaching. Appreciate the support. <laughs> Finally, number four, he says, seek God's kingdom first. By the way, this isn't my sermon. This is his sermon. Remember? Best sermon ever. Y'all were excited about it until this week. <laughs> Y'all loved everything Jesus said until we got to this part. Oh, I don't know if I like that or not. Well, take it up with him. See God's kingdom first, and then he will take care of you. So then he goes into this discourse about worry. And by the way, the original word for worry means to be torn apart. If you have a worrying mind, you have no rest up here. You're worrying about this might happen, and this might happen. What if this happens? And you're torn, you're pulled, no peace, no solace, no rest. You're just worried. What if this happens? What if that crash happens? What if I run out? Oh, worry, worry, worry. Why did God start talking about worry? I think he knew what his disciples were thinking. Remember, he's talking to his boys and said, hey, this is us. We're going to do this. We're going to do finances not the way the world does it. We're going to raise the bar here. And I believe what was happening in their minds happens in your minds right now. As you're contemplating, what if I start tithing? What if I start giving generously to missions? I think what's happening in your mind was happening in theirs. And we start thinking, you ready? I'm going to just get in your head for a minute. Well, if I do that, if I get generous and I start giving this out of what I've not been giving and start giving to this, then what happens if? What happens to my savings? What happens to my retirement? What happens to my fun money? And we begin, what happens if I have a medical emergency? And immediately we say, I hear you, I want to be generous, I'm thinking about being generous, but if I'm generous, what happens when I start being generous and the bottom falls out? I think they were thinking that. Well, if I choose this high path of generosity, what happens when I'm in dire need? And Jesus then starts talking straight at that, and he says, so don't worry about these things. Don't worry about your clothing and your, what you'll eat and what you'll wear And in another verse, he says, pagans run after that. By the way, pagans, it's not a compliment. Pagans are the heathens, the non-followers of Jesus, the people who don't live by faith. He said, all those people run after this. But you shouldn't. Why? Your father knows you need that stuff. Your father knows you need it. And if you look to God through a good eye, that he's a benevolent kind, caring, Jehovah Jireh God, and he knows you need it, then why are you worried about what you need? If my daughter has a serious physical need, financial need, and I've got it, she's going to be taken care of. Any parent would say the same thing. God has the ability to bless your socks off. He knows a need you may have, and you think he's going to let you go without? No. No. Jesus saying, your father knows you need it, so stop chasing it. And then he uses these two beautiful illustrations. I, I can't prove it, but I kind of personally think a, bird, a group of birds flew by as he's preaching the Sermon on the Mount. I think, blah, 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 they went up. He said, look at the birds of the air. Come on, y'all, they're outside. And when he says, look at the grass or the, uh, grass or the flowers, there had to be something out there. Look at here. And I was like, huh. Just sermon illustrations, all it was. He says, look at the birds of the air. They get up every day and they don't have storage. They don't have a fridge. They get up every day knowing they need to go find food today. And yet they don't go hungry. And they're not on Ativan or Xanax. (laughs) They're not consumed with worry. They're not losing their bearings. They're not going crazy with anxiety. 
Why? Because God takes care of them. Every day, God takes care of the birds of the air. They get up not knowing where the food's going to come from, but every day the food comes. They get up, they're not worried, they just go do their thing, and God blesses their socks off. And then he looks at them, and he says, don't you know you're more valuable than they are? If the birds can do all that and not stress, don't you know God cares more about you than them? And to all the PETA followers out there who think animals are so important, God help. Don't you know you're more valuable than they? What's he saying? If God takes care of the birds, he's going to take care of you. And look at the grass. Look at how beautiful they're clothed in all this splendor. They don't work. They don't talk. Now, this is not an idea for you not to go work. Let's just stop right here. If you're not working, you need to get a job. Let's go back to the birds. They go to work for their food. Let's do the birds. <laughs> Don't get me started on that, because I'll get out of Scripture in a hurry on that. We'll, we'll have a real talk. You know what I'm saying? Some of you girls dating a guy that don't, you driving, don't, mm, no, no, no. I got to keep moving on. Why would you date a guy? You got to drive around like a little teenager. Don't have a job, don't have a money, don't have car, don't have a bike to roll you around in. Watch you get a job. Become a man before you try to get a woman. That wasn't in my notes. That was just free of charge right there. <laughs> I'm getting more amens with that than I am the whole thing. <laughs> Jesus didn't even say any of this, and y'all amen in that. What was I supposed to be? Oh, the grass. And he says, hey, look at the grass. It's not worried about what it's wearing, but it's clothed in splendor and beauty. So why are God's children, why are my brothers and sisters, Jesus, I'm worried about this stuff? Why are you chasing, running around like a chicken with your head cut off like the rest of the world, like you don't have a father who's gracious and benevolent? Why are you pursuing and grinding and clawing and cheating and, and hoarding when, like God's going to hold back? Why are you doing that? The birds don't. The, God's taking care of all this. Won't he take care of you? Breathe. God's got you. Uh, if I can have the band come out. Here's, I think here's my last um, thing. If you're worried, and there's many of us who are, listen, I struggle with this thing myself. It's, it's in our nature. It's in our nature. Men want to provide. Men, not boys. Men want to provide. It's in our nature to think about tomorrow. It's wise to invest for retirement. I ain't taking any of that away. But when it becomes an anxiety, it actually becomes an a doubt and a distrust to the God who said he would take care of you. So if you're worried and you're stressed about the economy, if you're stressed because of medical bills, you're worried and you're stressed about college tuition, you're stressed because you need a new set of tires, you're stressed because braces are coming, they need braces, you're stressed because you don't know where next month's rent's coming from. You're stressed because your kids want to be in cheerleading. That costs so much money. You're stressed because the company may be laying off. You just heard last week before you left on Friday, they're, they're downsizing. And you're stressed and you're worried and you're anxious. Look at me. Stop it. Stop it. Breathe. Stop stressing and start seeking. Because here's what the promise was. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek the kingdom of God above all, all else and live righteously and he will give you everything that you need. That's a moment for somebody to say, thank you, Jesus. He's got you. Jesus said, my father's got you in his hands. Can I just give you a little resume for God before I step off the stage? The God who multiplies oil for widows who are bankrupt and about to lose their sons. That's your God. The God who multiplies loaves of bread and fish to a starving crowd. That's your God. 
The God who brought manna down from heaven and laid it on the earth so they just got up every morning and picked up what they needed for the day. That's your God. The God who provided water out of a rock that they were thirsty. That is your God. The God who made the sun stand still for one of his armies. That's your God. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The silver is his. The gold is his. That's your God. And if you know him as a benevolent, loving, gracious father, stop worrying. Put him first. Invest in heaven. And God will take care of you. That's his promise, not mine. Jesus, would you breathe peace, shalom, shalom peace over everybody in this room. Liberate us from the rat race. Deliver us from the pursuit and the chase and the greed for more and help us to rest in you. You'll provide for us, Lord. And certainly, Lord, give us wisdom to invest for the retirement. And give us wisdom of how we can succeed but Lord may we do it with eyes on you and how we can bless others you will take care of your children and I pray that that calm peace would just settle in on this house today and all three services but specifically in this one right here and somebody will leave here no longer anxious but at rest knowing you are God who takes care of your children in Jesus name would you stand on your feet everybody